Hi, everybody. How's everyone doing? Having a great time here at Videonomics at the Ritz. Beautiful. Finishing strong. We're, we're heading to the home stretch here. Everyone's been here for a few days. We're trying to bring a little levity here for 20 minutes after lunch. I know. Uh, so enjoy the journey. Uh, my name is Matt Doyle. I'm the EVP of Broadcast and Digital Video at GYK Antler. Uh, we're an agency in Boston. Uh, before that, uh, I was a feature producer for 13 years at ESPN. Worked with this fine gentleman, Kenny Main. Kenny, you want to introduce yourself to the Videonomics crowd? Uh, I was trying to be casual by having the untucked shirt, but it did wear good enough shoes instead of flip-flops. Uh, I missed most of the seminars because I was at the Seahawks Monday night game, flew in late, but uh, got to meet a lot of people on the side, so happy to be here. Matt and I, like you said, we've worked a uh, bunch of years together. We used to do pretend football stories every week. We had one with Tom Brady and Justin Bieber. Bieber was mad because he had stole, or Brady had stolen his hair look. It made sense back then. But we've done a ton in that sense, and then we got to do things even after Matt left, which we'll get uh, the video up on that, where we toured the world and found unusual sports. Working across the way with a competitor, but because we care so much about you, we're willing to put down. We're, bring, we're bringing yeah. people together here. Fox Sports and ESPN together on Mortal one stage. Doesn't happen that often. But Gabe Goodwin, introduce yourself to Videonomics crowd. Yeah, well, I'm only a competitor as of recently. I worked with these guys at ESPN and ran uh, social and digital content for production there. I'm doing very similar at Fox Sports. So yeah, we're, we're putting aside any beefs today to try to talk a little bit with you guys. <laughs> OK, so there's our, uh, there's our names. It's pretty good. So uh, brand storytelling versus advertising. So uh, again, everybody here knows the, the, the rules uh, you know, as they are. Brand storytelling versus advertising. Advertising is what's going to do the heavy lifting. For, for me and for us, what we find is we don't like to you know, muddy up the, 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 the storytelling process with you know, heavy branded sort of shoving it down your throat. We like to leave that to the other forms of Not that we're against making 30 second commercials when the opportunity presents itself. <laughs> Just putting that out there. But keep the heavy handed sell, sell, sell outside of your long form branded digital content. Yeah. Leave that as a space to tell stories. As an example, when we did a show called Wider World of Sports, you guys, the ones old enough remember the old Wide World of Sports, Agony of Defeat, all that. So we added an R. We called it the wider world of sports. Somehow our boss fell for that. And for three years, we got to travel the world and find unique sporting events. They had elephant polo, Irish road bowling, the Palio, that crazy horse race in Italy. Um, and so we had sponsors who, who were attached to it. But the original idea was, hey, let's wear their clothes in the first one. Let's drive their car in the second one. Eventually, all that got thrown out. And it became, why don't we just do a good job? And if people like what we did, which is now called content, I still call it a story. Uh, if people like what that is and the sponsors attached to it, people are then gonna like that sponsor. It's presented by. So really, it's kind of simplistic. You go out and do a good job and turn out good material and find unique things and then the advertiser gets its advertising without holding up the product and like Matt said, you know, kind of forcing it down your throat. So an interesting point, you skipped ahead to wider world because I don't think you've even looked at the deck, to no. be honest. But, uh, uh, <laughs> God bless you. Uh, the, you know, the interesting thing about Wider World of Sports, so it started in 2009, I believe, and it was one of ESPN's first ventures into. This is uh, called a deck. They used to be called slides. <laughs> Same thing. I call it so, content. Con it's, it's content. It's okay. all content. But Wider World of Sports was one of ESPN's first forays into creating original digital content uh, that, that got sold and was branded. So uh, you know, when we were first pitching the idea and talking about putting it on the internet, all the bosses at ESPN looked at us sideways, like, how, how does it, it doesn't, you gotta, it's gotta go on television before it can go to the internet. And nobody was really thinking that way, which is really surprising when you think of it, to, to make original digital content at that point. So the fact that ESPN took a chance on that show, you know, got it, got it sponsored, it ended up making decent money for the company, and then the content itself ended up being of a level that up until that point, you know, was heretofore unseen for creating internet content. Everyone's like, oh, it's for the internet. You guys can just run out there with your iPhones. They didn't even have iPhones back then. But run out there with your rinky-dink cameras and put something up on the internet, and it'll, it'll work. We took a different bet to that, put some production value into it, valued the storytelling. And thankfully, we had John Skipper behind us telling us and pushing us to make it more than you know, just an internet story. So that's a little bit of wider world of sports. Do you want to show the clip 
Now it's a later. I thought in the you slide, wanted to we'll talk about ahead. numbers. What about these important numbers? We'll get to the, there's so many numbers. How many numbers have you guys heard this past week? Our friends in the back, do you guys have the little teaser video from Wider World of Sports since we're talking about it now? Can we cue that up? Let the festival begin. It seems like a three-day festival of a lot of indiscriminate fireworks and people hitting each other with exactly. bull penis tendons. Exactly. Here we go up some volcanic rock. This is among the dumbest things I've ever done. I do this for the people of Nicaragua. Hit me. This is the Piazza del Campo, an Italian plaza straight out of central casting. And twice a year, it turns into this. Wild horses! Wild horses! We don't know who won! 23 divers are killed in this last war. Defending bridge and, and old town. They never came back, but they, they didn't do that for, for nothing. If uh, they had told you that I was a late entrant into the competition, how intimidated would you be right now? Terrified. Mm -hmm. Terrified. Let's review what I know about the sport. A man with an extremely long golf club swings as hard as possible. Other men with what appears to be cheese boards try to knock the ball down. After that, God knows what happens. When all is said and done, there's nothing left to say or do. That's still available for sponsorship if any of you are <laughs> Cut. Yeah, there you no, go. No, two yeah, clarifications. That wasn't a gratuitous joke. They really were fighting with bull penis tendons. That's a thing they've been doing for 300 years in Nicaragua. Yes, uh, big part festival. of the John the Baptist Festival, Absolutely. I believe. And the other, we didn't just totally screw around. Like, as you saw, there was the, the short clip about the bridge jumping. That was, I don't think the whole thing was quite serious because it was all about the breakup of Yugoslavia and the war that took place. And that bridge had been shot down during the war, and they were able to rebuild it and then restart this thing that had meant so much to them, diving off the bridge for competition. So kind of did a little of both, but we did mostly screw around. Yes, a lot, a lot of expensive hotels. So, uh, you know, again, by the numbers, uh, uh, by this point, everyone already knows a lot of this stuff. 300 hours of new videos uploaded to YouTube every minute. That's, you know, a, a crazy amount of content being loaded. By the numbers, 42% the amount of all time online devoted to watching video. 43% uh, of baby boomers are using YouTube compared to 91% of internet users aged 13 to 17. So clearly, uh, you know, the, the people using the internet, the people consuming the content are skewing younger. It's a much more sophisticated marketplace that we're dealing with. And as marketers, we need to realize that the folks out there are much more savvy now. They're more savvy consumers compared to 15, 20 years ago. So when we're being, when we're marketing to them, when we're telling brand stories, we need to be aware of this and we need to be smart about what it is that we're selling them. So creating perfect alignment. Again, this was going to lead into Kenny's video, but Kenny was, <laughs> uh, if you want to speak to the fact of the, you know, the brands that came to you originally came to ESPN looking for somebody uh, looking for somebody like you to do a project and it was fairly open-ended. And they were stuck with me. <laughs> um, yeah, no, what really had happened was we were doing a different show, you know, Parks and Recreation, Aubrey Plaza, she did well there, Ben Schwartz doing that show with Don Cheadle, uh, Allison Becker's doing big things, John Glazer's, got, so everybody involved in that show has gone on, but I'm still there, damn it, because we're going to do something good again. Uh, so once they killed that for reasons unknown to us, that's why we, we went in and said, why don't we ask these sponsors if they're willing to do something different, which is... Again, going back to what I said at the top, it's just good storytelling. Unless you're selling yarn, uh, a cat chasing yarn isn't really all that entertaining. The product still has to be good in the end. 
which when you put up all those numbers previously, they, they expect something because they are savvier now. They're not going to ex ex accept you know, just anything put out that's on the behalf of the client. The, you have to put some time into it. All of those shoots we did, we might have milked it a little bit because of the good hotels, but like the Italy one, it, you needed 10 days or so to really get the essence of it and, and see every last bit of it to understand the people and what this meant to them. And if they win, their wine crop will have a great yield. And if their enemy district wins, then they'll have a bad year. They have all these superstitions. So we were able to, in that storytelling, you know, paint a pretty good picture of what goes on in that town for the last 500 years. And those who were associated with us for, you know, paying for our trip uh, came out well in the end as well. But pulling it back to, again, the original uh, concept of the brands coming to you. JCPenney came to ESPN, Volkswagen came to ESPN, and they have ad dollars to spend. And they come to ESPN and they discuss what's the best usage of our ad dollars. Do they want to give X amount of millions of dollars to ESPN and then have, you know, the top 10 plays brought to you by JCPenney? Well, maybe, but is there some different way to try and maximize their value, to try and capitalize on the audience that, the demographics that are attracted to Kenny and other sports center personalities, and do it in a sort of unique and engaging way? So, you know, we give a decent amount of credit to Jay-Z Penny, who was the first sponsor who jumped on, and then Volkswagen in the later years, for sort of having the faith and, and putting the dollars behind the program to sort of you know, take a chance on sort of something that ESPN hadn't really done before in that long form content. And that's taking nothing away from Nordstrom or <laughs> Saab. I would sell Coke and Pepsi in the same commercial if given the opportunity. <laughs> so, uh, but no, I mean, I keep hitting the, the same theme. And I mean, you can speak to yeah. that where you guys are, you can't just put out Schlock and, and, and stick a sponsor's name. It's actually going to work in the reverse. They're going to be seen disfavorably. Yeah, I mean, one of the things where we know, I think all of us in the room know is, you know, you only have so much time to capture someone's attention, right? So we think of storytelling as beginning, middle, and end, and we want to build an arc and kind of pay it off. But what we're finding, especially on Facebook and to some degree YouTube, is those first few seconds matter, right? So if, if the ultimate goal is to pay off the, the good partnership with the brand, you got to get the people to the end. And so one of the things these guys did really well, as evidenced by that video, is like their sizzle material. There's stuff right out of the gate that'll get your eye, and then you're in, and now they can take you along the journey. But I think one caution to everyone in the room is, you know, think about what those first few seconds look like. Think about how to let the people who do this stuff best pick the few key ingredients that matter most to you and then work them in as the story goes, but grab people right off the bat. Less than half of uh, the people who start a video on Facebook are gonna make it to the end, right? So just be honest about where, where should the best stuff go, and then the people who stuck with you, how do you pay them off throughout? If you start with a firecracker explosion in that's Nicaragua, a that's going to hold them. Yeah. Time. They'll wonder, how did that end up happening? It act, no, that was in the moment. Like yeah. they, they have this big parade, and for, there's dogs running through the street. But that was the beautiful thing of that is we, we really went there to learn. And, and a lot of times, Matt and I, I don't know how many of you watched the old Countdown show when we did our little pretend football stories every week. A lot of those were just whole fiction. We would tell the player, here's your line. This was more real journalism. We went and learned about it and then try to present it in an entertaining way. Uh, we, we called out some of these uh, other examples of branded content, some sort of long form things that we really love. And, and uh, one of the ones that really stuck out, I mean, obviously BMW Films just brought back, and it's been discussed in some of the round tables and the meetings here. BMW Films 15 years ago sort of broke the mold, laid the foundation and the groundwork for what sort of long form branded content could be. Uh, and they just brought it back again with, with Clive Owen and the Escape, which is tremendous. Uh, but another brand uh, that one of the projects that really stuck out to us was uh, the Pepsi Uncle Drew series that, that went on with uh, Kyrie Irving, who's a point guard for the, for the Cavs. So that to me is a great example of a brand uh, taking a chance and being properly aligned with uh, the talent and the endorser that, that, that they're working with. So, the, the back story behind a lot of that was that Kyrie Irving was actually taking acting classes at Duke uh, and wanted to sort of do more than just a commercial. So he came up with this character, this Uncle Drew character, pushed it on Pepsi, and Pepsi sort of, again, in a great sort of example of a brand trusting in the folks that they're working with in the creative side in addition to their endorser, you know, put the faith in Kyrie Irving to bring this character to life and turn this sort of off-the-wall idea of Kyrie Irving dressing up like an old man and playing street ball into a really power, super great, amazingly entertaining, you know, branded content series that now is sort of the most highly anticipated thing of the NBA season every year. What's the new Uncle Drew campaign? So that's a, a you know just one example of 
a, a brand working together with their endorser to be properly aligned and to give you know, folks some entertainment and some value so that they can engage in what it is they're watching. Because again, like we've discussed in you know, the, the, the dozens of panels that we've had so far, if you're not giving your viewers something to engage in, something of value, then ultimately it's gonna be tuned out. Well, plus particularly I think with the athletes, they're real people. They happen to throw things farther, have better jumpers than the rest of us, but they have, they have other attributes and they wanna showcase themselves in different ways. Like I just got to work with Blake Griffin of the Clippers. It's for Verizon's new thing, the new venture, Go90. We had one with uh, uh, Donnell Rawlings who used to be on the Chappelle show and he plays his uncle and pretending that he's seven years old joining a youth basketball team. Now, that was our starting point. And then from there it got even sillier. But again, in the end, they look good. Their users are saying, oh cool, they're putting out content that I didn't expect you know, to see on my phone. And it benefits them when, when quality stuff is being, being put out in their name without holding up saying we have great service. It's just putting out a good story, they're attached to it and everybody wins. So again, content is a long-term play that's about developing relationships, trust, and providing value. And that's how it, you know, again, slightly different than traditional advertising. Kenny, what are, you know, you just mentioned the, the Blake Griffin thing. In your experience, because you've done so this much time brand for question content, and this, yeah. this okay. is a personal question. Uh, <laughs> which brands and experiences have you found the, have, have worked the most successfully, created the best content uh, out of the ones that you've done? The, either the next one or the last one. So, uh, no, I, the ones I like the best, now we were talking about this before when we had, it doesn't seem like we rehearsed, I know, but we did. Um, <laughs> it's tough. Yeah. Tough, tough with the... We polish up later. Uh, no, it, when they, I mean, and, it, and it's a fine line where when somebody is bankrolling something, they clearly want to have a hand in it. It's their name on the line, it's their money being put to work, but I think they're, there's something to be said for trusting those you're, you're going to put into your employee and let them do their thing and not interfere too much. So I think my favorite ones have been the ones where here's what the message we want, here's the script we have, but now do it, as they say, in your own voice. Where we, I did one with Jeff Gordon for AARP where he was retiring. So the joke, he's like 43 years old, but he needs some retirement advice. And we had one, it was pretty funny and it worked, but we made up another one in the room and that became the, the main one that they ran with as they went forward in their campaign. Just did a different one for Ally Bank where they're having this penny promotion, the lucky pennies, and they just said, get that message across, but do it any way you want. So there is a fine line to that and you, we were, you could yeah. speak to that as well where you have, you have to give the respect to the client, obviously it's their money and their project, but if they hire you to do a job, let the people who know how to do that, that go ahead and do side. it. Yep. Yeah, I mean, one of the things, you know, the term I use a lot in production is just hit beats, right? So it's not so much about the script. If you hired someone like Kenny, he's probably going to be able to do anything you need him to do, but you're better off saying, here are the beats, here are the must-dos, and then you kind of shape it around that. And more often than not, as humans, not just the folks we call talent, as humans, we always feel better with something that is our idea, right? So I could come up here and, and talk through that slide, or I could kind of touch on what that slide's about in my own voice. And so what we try to do as producers is figure out the most important thing, like the, the must have, make that the beat that Kenny's gonna hit, but then let him kind of work his way to it and work his way off of it to the next key beat. And then I think, personally, I think that's just the best way to get what you want out of something. If you're paying a lot of money and you're asking a guy to do it for you, you're better off with beats than scripts. Well, and additionally, I think people getting over the fear of failure is, the, is a big thing, because we, we shoot you know, the ESPN campaign, the This Is Sports Center, they've been running for 20 odd years, and they do a great job, you know, percentage-wise, they hit more home runs than not. But oftentimes, we'll have shot it, and we're really happy, we leave the room, and it comes out six months later, and it's like, did they take the most conservative thing all the way, like, why did they go there instead of going over there? So, I'm always, over that way, you know, in the line of don't get fired, but take it to that extreme. <laughs> and I think sometimes people are guilty of let's be a little safe, when I think being a little dangerous is actually the thing that's gonna impact the, the viewership better. So again, in, in closing, as our time's coming to an end here, I think from, from all of our standpoints, you know, myself individually, having come from both the network side as a, as a director producer, now working on the marketing and, and branding side, you know, the, the one thing that holds true, no matter no matter what you do, just make things that are that that are consistently high quality. Hold yourself to a standard, and those things will ultimately resonate. Trust your gut, Kenny. That was thought. offensive, and she left. So <laughs> we're dead. <laughs>
I, I wanted to, uh, you guys have places to go? You got more time? Anybody have questions that we can engage with you that way, like specifically? Wow. We covered we it all, did we? all of their questions in I feel advance. we did. What's improved in your life? Anybody, what's something specific that's going better for you right now? In your relationship or in business? <laughs> Nobody? Cubs. Cubs did all right. That was the, probably the best game ever played. That was something, huh? Cool. In LA. That's good. good. Jeff Fisher. Those are more observations than questions. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, what's improved? You're right. We did turn the. Okay, sorry. Question in the back. That's a good question. That's a great. I do it. All, I like get a lot of no's. I, I don't worry about the no's, and you go to the yeses or the maybes. But yeah, I think I have like five ideas in my pocket that I'd love, and then you go attack such and such industry because that one would fit. You know, that joke would fit them or that concept. So yeah, you can do it both ways, because I think the other way, I mean, the conventional way is company X hires production company Y, and they have a bunch of meetings, and in six months, they make an app. But I think sometimes if, if you have this great idea that's applicable to, a, you, just, you just need the product. You know, here's Bounty Paper Towels all of a sudden. So anybody from Bounty, we have a pretty good one. Just, we did. <laughs> uh, or Viva. Um, but. No, but like originally, like so for, for wider world, that, that sort of played out where, again, uh, JCPenney came to ESPN, and ESPN's you know, ad sales and marketing department uh, you know, works to, to sort of parse out the ad dollars and you know, pitches to them an idea like, hey, we've got Kenny Mayne potentially thinking about working on this show. That gets run by them. They say, yes, we'd like to do that. We'd like to have our money go to that and put our name on a Kenny Mayne fa front-facing digital content series. Uh, but you know, other times, you know, again, we, it, it's sort of once you have proof of concept for certain things, we've we've done that and taken that out and pitched it to brands and tried to sell it that way as well. So I think it depends on the situation. But uh, originally, yeah, wider world was was brought with internal ad dollars and parsed out for and that project. I think that got that got better. The, not that the first one was no good, but the second one got better than the first one. You should always be better on your second day anyway. But we initially. The upfronts, you know, the big sales song and dance in New York. We we were needing something to show because right then we didn't have the advertiser yet. They actually came on board kind of in the interim, so we took a trip to London fast for no reason, as it turned out. But we went like, we'll do something funny over there. Let's find cricket. Let's find you know. So we went with kind of a safer approach, English-speaking country. But then after that, we were able to format things and research it better. Sure. Like, there are a lot of brands who are like, yeah, Kenny, go do whatever you want to do, but here are all the things I don't want you to say about us or our competition. Yeah. Well, thankfully, we never really ran into too many. We were very lucky, I will say, for that particular. I've, since, since the wider world of sports times, uh, we've certainly, I've certainly personally run into. Uh, from the agency side, a lot more sort of restrictions and red tape around what it is and what can and cannot be said. But from, a, from that standpoint, at the very front side, we sort of discussed and laid out what it was we were planning on doing, what their ad dollars were going to get them in terms of you know, uh, um, placement, mentions, uh, tweet, Facebook posts, and things like that. But being completely sort of transparent up front and, and having your sort of ducks in a row out of the gate, um, and having that all and coming to an agreement then before you take off and fly to London or South Africa or Thailand so that you know what it is that you have to do, what it is ultimately that they're requiring and what you have to deliver when you're there so you don't come back from somewhere and have them you know, unhappy with the end result. So. And I'm not against making fraudulent claims. We were talking about two different things. Like one's an ad where you do have to worry about that. The other, as Matt was, was leaning on more, was let's go out and make great stories and provide content that they can attach their name to. And then the other way around it, because you've seen it a lot with, on TV as well with the mini commercials that bleed then into like a you know, quote unquote standard commercial. So we, we did some of that as well, where you, know, you had like a little product mention at the front end, like those automatic rolls at the top of, of the video. Pre -roll. But then, yeah, but then within, I call them automatic rolls. Um, but then within the body of the story, we 
There was no mention of it, you know? Yeah. And that was a debate. Some companies really want to, yeah. like, hey, can, can he wear our shirt, you know? And it's a, a, little, a little more subtle approach to do it than holding it up and saying, you know, $49.99 or whatever the case is. I, I think the easiest way to say it, and I'm, I'm sure they're going to give us the blink and light in a moment here, is the brand and the, and the production company or the talent, whoever's going to be involved, should probably draw the lines and agree what the lines, the shape of that is. And then folks like these two or me, whoever, paint within those lines. And it's like, don't use this color, but every other color is good to go. Like, that's kind of the process that works best for everyone. I think you want to paint outside the lines on take one or two. There you actually. go. No, I'm being serious. Like, no, I know. Oftentimes you'll shoot, like say, in a commercial environment, and you know the client wants this script word for word, or, or you do it a little bit different maybe, and then usually the director's like, all right, now do whatever you want. But it never, it never feels original to me, because everybody knows now I'm going to do this. I'd rather slip that in on take number two and see if they liked it, then they might play off of that. So, but obviously, yeah, I mean, we're not saying with any disrespect. Obviously, whoever you're working for, you should respect that relationship and, and serve them as well as you can. But, and who knows, maybe they have great ideas too. It's not like we're saying nobody else but us has ideas. So hopefully it's just a happy marriage of, of people, smart people, you know, kicking around inventive things. Communication is key, always. Indeed. Great. Uh, well, we'd like to thank you guys for your time and uh, enjoy the rest of the day here at Videonomics. Yay. Good times.